Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Matt Hamilton. I'm a developer advocate at Protocol Labs. I've been working on a technology, working with a technology called Interplanetary Consensus, or IPC, which is a scalability layer for Filecoin. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a background about IPC and then talk specifically about how you can use general message passing to send data back and forth between uh, subnets, between parent and child subnets on the IPC network. Right? So IPC is a scalability technology for Filecoin and it unlocks like a level of performance for Web3, the idea being that we're trying to, uh, with like Web2, everything is obviously a lot faster because it's more centralized. The idea behind uh, IPC is to build up effectively a tree of subnets, a tree of blockchains that can give us much higher performance and scalability. Uh, so yeah, you can create recursive subnets. So you can create, say, a layer two, offer that layer three, layer four, layer five. So it can give you kind of vertical scalability or uh, horizontal scalability. And another great thing about it is using the Filecoin virtual machine, the FEM, it's very customizable. So you can customize uh, like the subnet type parameters, things like your uh, gas schedule, the to native token, uh, block times, things like that, whether or not it's a permissioned or a permissionless uh, blockchain. But you can also with FEM, because it's modular, uh, the, the FEM, the Filecoin virtual machine, we currently have the Filecoin Ethereum virtual machine as a runtime, so you can run Solidity smart contracts. But uh, you can also create uh, your own like built-in actors or custom syscalls that can break out of the EVM sandbox and access stuff beyond just the, the, the native blockchain itself. So say you want to implement uh, something that's not available within Solidity, uh, something like a JSON parser or maybe a new, um, uh, a new or different like hash function or cipher function or something like that that you don't have available. Uh, you can code that uh, in there as well. But like I said, you can reach outside of the of the sandbox. So we've got an example that reads a number of files off of the file system, right? As a, just a trivial example. But maybe you are actually, you're interfacing with some external um, hardware or something like that, some secure enclave, whatever it might be. So IPC subnets, like I said, you can create a hierarchy of subnets and they might be specific application specific, what is often referred to as app chains um, for specific use cases. So you might have say a gaming subnet, a gaming layer two, or a database subnet that's tailored specifically uh, for running database queries. And then you might subdivide that further. So you might have a sharded database or you might have different games uh, running off of your gaming subnet. And then you might end up splitting it up regionally, for example. Uh, because one of the um, main constraints of uh, blockchains is the consensus mechanism, which ultimately comes down to the laws of physics as to how fast you can send uh, messages backwards and forwards between the nodes, right? The speed of light, basically. So you might end up having regional subnets because you want to have a consensus mechanism that literally you need to have the nodes in a specific geographic area in order to go fast enough. Now again, referring back to the name, Interplanetary Consensus. This is coming from Protocol Labs. We're known for the Interplanetary File System, IPFS. You know, taking that thinking from a file system to a blockchain. What does it mean if we actually have a blockchain that is literally spanning planets, right? Are we gonna to get to that point? Let's, that's pretty far into the future, but with that design thinking enables you to come up with a solution that will be architected very differently uh, and allowing you to say, okay, we want a blockchain that uh, has a subnet that is working within a data center. So we're talking millisecond latency versus, you know, cross regions or, you know, uh, cross geographies. So a quick little bit, starting to get into a little bit of the technicals of um, subnet message passing, GMP, general message passing itself. So the subnets consist of a number of smart contracts. For each subnet you have, so say we've got a child subnet here, and we've got, in this case, the root network, the parent network. So for each of these child networks, there is a subnet actor, one per child subnet. 
and then there's the gateway actor, of which there is one of those per root network. So if you were then to build like another set of um, children off of child A, again, there would be one gateway actor here and several subnet actors here, one for each of the children off of that. So the uh, gateway actor is responsible for message passing between the different subnets, right? It's got a, effectively a post box, you know, post office uh, type protocol. Yeah. Uh, so there's, there's one gateway actor at each, level. at each level, and then you can have you have multiple subnet actors. So there's no limit on the number of subnet actors per gotcha. right. But each each child can only be connected to one parent, right? It's, it's just a straight tree. You can't have loops in it and, and that kind of thing, right? So the subnet actor is responsible for things like uh, the consensus info, the finality, that side of things. And like I said, the gateway actor is responsible for intercommunication between the different subnets. And we have a tool called IPC CLI, and that is what is used to um, kind of set these all up, the subnets up, right? And at the end, uh, I'll give you a series of uh, QR codes and links to um, examples of how you can, how you can use those, uh, those tools there. So I think this is pretty much covering what I've just talked about the, with the, the gateway actors and the subnet actors and what they each do. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna quickly go through some example, just go through some code to give you a bit of an example about um, how you could implement this in real world. We've got a mixed audience here, so I'm gonna try not to go into too much into the weeds, but I'm gonna give a bit of an overview here. So, there's an example in our IPC repository under extras and linked token. There's an example here for this linked token example. It's an ERC20 token, so a, a fungible token like USDC, for example, that is able to be passed from a parent net to a subnetwork. So like I say, within the IPC uh, repository, uh, extra is linked token. And if we go into the source here, there's a few contracts here um, of interest. So the first, the easiest one is the USDC um, Solidity contract itself for the token. This is just a standard open Zeppelin contract. Um, nothing specific about it nothing that is IPC um, specific really there, right? So that's the easy one to go through on that case. Um, then we have two contracts here, replica and controller, right? The link token controller is what runs on the parent network and the link token replica runs on the child network. So if we, Look, uh, right, okay, I've got a diagram here. So, the way in which this flow works is say we've got this USDC token and we want to pass it from a parent network down to the subnetwork, right? What happens is the ERC20 token is passed to this token controller contract, which in this case locks the token up into the contract. Once it's locked the token up, it then communicates using a uh, IPC message to a corresponding to uh, contract, the replica contract, on the child network. So this is the parent network, this is the child network. This replica contract sees that the tokens have been locked there and it mints a corresponding amount of that equivalent token on the child network, right? Um, and then going the opposite direction, um, the tokens on the subnetwork, so this is the child network at the top now, um, they're transferred back, they are burned. It tells the uh, controller contract on the parent network they've been burned, and then that then releases those tokens back to the original thing, right? Because a token can only really exist on one blockchain at a time. These are separate, completely separate blockchains uh, with their, their own separate consensus, right? That obviously has to be atomic. Pardon me? That obviously has to be atomic. Yes, that is atomic. So there's actually a um, a kind of uh, a validity check that happens once this is done. So 
the uh, controller contract will actually check back with the replica contract to actually ensure that the, the burn has happened uh, in that case. So going back to our code here, we have this replica and this controller uh, contract here that I just mentioned. But most of the guts is within this linked token contract. Like I said, I'm not going to go through sort of line by line here because that'll probably bore you all to tears. But the bits to point out here are we have a number of uh, data structures specific to IPC here that are imported from the IPC package. And we've actually got a, uh, an IPC SDK with this uh, IPC contract uh, kind of template there that's, that's used, right? And there's a number of data structures. So there's a, um, where have we got here? Uh, bum, 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 bum. Yeah, there's this IPC envelope. So when a communication happens between the subnet and the parent and vice versa, that's the data structure that's actually sent between them, this IPC envelope. And that contains things like the payment information. So how are you going to pay for the transaction on the other subnet? And also uh, the actual method that you're going to be calling and on what contract you're going to be calling. So it's, it's effectively like an RPC call on the other subnet there. And da, da, da. let's see here. So when this is instantiated, um, you're going to pass in the underlying token, uh, the gateway address as well, the subnet ID of the linked subnet. And here's probably the, the guts of the interesting bit, this linked transfer method here, um, in which it captures the token. So depending upon the implementation, like I said, you probably want to lock the tokens, um, but you may, you, when you go the other direction, you're burning the tokens. This one link token like, um, contract, I'll show you in a minute, is actually used for both the replica and the controller. They're both subclasses. So it's kind of doing a, a, a bit of both sides. And this capture token is overridden in each of those contracts to either lock or burn. And I'll show you that in a, in a minute here. But we actually uh, construct this message here um, and we perform the IPC call, right? So these are methods that come from that IPC SDK, and we actually perform that IPC call that actually results in the call being made from the parent to the subnet or the, the subnet to the parent, right? Um, and it's logged as an unconfirmed transfer. To your point about atomicity, um, there is a confirmation step that then happens afterwards and it emits an event that the tokens have been sent there, right? Uh, so, like I said, each one of the controller and the replicas subclass that contract I just showed, and they implement their specific side of the deal. So, for the link token controller, so this is on the parent subnet, we have these capture tokens, and all this is doing is doing a, a transfer from the sender to this contract. So it's just taking the, taking the tokens from the sender and locking them up in this contract, uh, the amount of tokens that have been specified. And the opposite, when we release, we just transfer them back, right? So that's what the controller is doing on the parent subnet. On the replica, when we capture the tokens on the replica, so we're sending tokens back to the, the parent, uh, they get burnt. Because if you think these replica tokens are just copies of the token that's on the parent subnet. So when you pass them back, you can just burn them because you're effectively uh, the issuer of that token on that subnet, right? So you can mint and burn accordingly. So you're burning those tokens. And on the release side, so when you're actually issuing them, so when they come from the parent to the subnet, uh, mint gets called. So you actually mint these tokens and send them on their way, okay? So that's a, a, a brief example of that to show kind of the little bits and pieces of how you can put this together. And like I said, you can kind of go through there um, and have a look in more detail or come and ask me later um, if you want some more detail there. In terms of things going on, um, we have a, well, there's the hackathon that's going on right here, right now. Uh, people are building away, the deadline is tomorrow morning. Uh, people are building away on IPC. 
We have, so that's at East Denver. We have a long running hackathon that's going on at the moment with Dora Hacks. So that goes on until 1st of March, is it? March, something, I think so, yeah. Uh, no, we're in March now, aren't we? April. It runs about a month's time, right? So that's a longer running one with Dora Hacks that's going on at the moment. Uh, we have the Early Builders Program as well. Um, oh, that's the hackathon, the longer running hackathon, sorry. That's the one that's going on now. Uh, we've got that and we've got the stuff that's happening right now. And if you want to get links to all of that, there's a link tree here and a QR code. that will take you to uh, the IPC page, the documentation, the list of events we're here this week and the various hackathons that are going on at the moment to find out more.